On October 1917, oil was discovered on the farm of John McCluskey in Ranger, Texas. As the saying goes, nothing would ever be the same. The changes that took place during the next four years were enough to overwhelm any community, yet, as you will see, Ranger handled them with amazing organization and skill by creating a plan to build an infrastructure of roads, sewers, power, hospitals, schools, and other vital services, and taking action through the support of the oil and rail industries, community involvement, and municipal government with tax levies and bond issues. McCluskey's next-door neighbor, John Rust, later to be a prominent lawyer, was 13 at the time. He described the first few weeks like this. According to Rust, people began arriving in town the very next day, riding on the top of the train, even clinging to the cowcatcher in front, hanging from the windows, doing anything they could just to find a way to get to the boomtown. Now, the emphasis on next day is mine, of course. The quote comes from a Modi Boatwright interview many years later and may be tainted by youthful memory of a boy since become a man. But it is certain that over the next few months, a town with a population of 800 reached over 40,000, while the surrounding area reached, by some estimates, 100,000. The town would stabilize about four years later as the boom faded out, around 16,000. To say they were overwhelmed is an understatement. On that October 1917 day, there were no paved roads. It had unstable electricity no sewers, and a crank telephone system. They got their water from the private lake of one of the prominent citizens. They had no municipal offices or city officials, including police officers. It was not even technically a town. They had no legal authority to collect taxes for the purpose of creating public works such as these. I will end this story in February 1921 because the West Texas Chamber of Commerce held their annual convention in Ranger that month, three and a half years after oil was discovered. Approximately 400 people attended. It speaks volumes that the city was not able to just absorb but accommodate and entertain these attendees as if the city had been firmly established for decades. What happened in those three and a half years is the story I get to tell for the next 15 minutes. Funding for this great enterprise came from three sources, the railroad and oil companies, private enterprise, mostly via the efforts of the Chamber of Commerce, and last, chronologically, the municipal government. First, I wanna take a minute to give you an impression of the stress the population density was placing on the resources with a description of the rag towns. This was the first boom in American history in which the workers took their families with them. They arrived with nothing more than their clothing, hoping to make a new life. Within weeks, thousands of families were spread over farmers' fields in cardboard lean-tos and semi-solid canvas tents. Garbage accumulated quickly, as did human waste. Often, privies were built improperly in inadequate numbers for the population and insufficiently cleaned. Disease spreading vermin and flies soon swarmed, compounding the problem. The filth, odor, and rats led the population to refuse to use them, causing defilement to the adjacent grounds, sometimes for acres. One of the first ways pressure began to be released was through the oil company's use of company camps. We don't consider 10 or 20 miles far to travel for work, but it was an all day trip then, especially on bad roads. They were all bad roads. To save time, people were already establishing rag towns near the work sites. It was cost effective for the companies to build small towns near where large groupings of wells were located. As railroad spurs were laid and transportation of goods became easier, this became more common. By providing housing and other amenities, such as a grocery store near the work site, the oil company could indoctrinate the employee and his family into the company values, perspectives, and culture. 
This humble oil camp in Cisco, Texas, was the largest of its kind and did not close until 1956. Another, more entrepreneurial method was offered by some of the railroad lines. Railroads were one of the most important parts of the oil business. The oil was discovered by Texas and Pacific Railroad, who made it a practice to explore along their routes for additional exploitable resources. Early on, the T&P had a complete monopoly on transporting oil out of the area and transporting in the necessary equipment to build the rigs and pipelines and supply the consumer goods of the newly prosperous workers and their families. Soon, competing lines arrived. The Texas Central added a north-south line that touched in Cisco, while the Heyman Kell connected the Texas Central through Dublin to Wichita Falls. This connected Ranger to the rest of the United States via a north-south route. Jake Heyman did something even more impressive, however. He built towns from the ground up. Every eight to 10 miles along the route, a whole new town was laid out at a railroad spur and planned so that just about the time the railroad got there, the plats were drawn up, sewer power and other basic utilities were installed, and all the building materials had been laid out ready for sale. Ads in the paper extolled the virtues of getting out of the crowded town into your own home, and a party on the first train into the new town pressured people into buying. The towns ran near established well sites, and since people were ready to leave their tents, many of these purpose-built towns had populations of 2,000 to 5,000 on their first day of existence. The Heyman towns were Jim Kern, Breckwalker, and Frankel, north of Ranger, and Ed Hobby and Jake Heyman to the south. None still exist today. R.Q. Lee did something similar out of Cisco, establishing the town of Luray, but building up the pre-existing towns of Gunsight, Wayland, and Necessity. While Lee Ray vanished with the boom, Gunsight, Wayland, and Necessity still have small populations today. The second method of funding for this great initiative I mentioned was private enterprise. The private side included the original city fathers and citizens as well, railroad and oil men and other businessmen who settled there. They quickly formed a powerful chamber of commerce that created an environment conducive to growth and encouraged the kind of forethought and preparedness that would enable prosperity across more than just the oil sector. Merchants and businessmen arrived at the earliest part of the boom to open businesses, hundreds of them. It started with hotels and restaurants, then apartments to house and feed the newcomers. At the end of 1920, Ranger had five grocery stores, five produce stores, 18 dry goods stores, and an assortment of specialty stores. There were six car dealerships and a seventh that specialized in work trucks. Six businesses based their wholesale operations out of Ranger to service their smaller shops in the spur communities and oil camps. Catering specifically to the oil and rail industry were supply houses with over $12 million in stock, including the only plant in Texas that manufactured drilling jars. The newspaper employed 50 people and the telegraph office employed 35 and handled 1,200 messages a day. It was the 14th largest city in Texas, a position now held by Amarillo. More than anything else, they opened lumber yards. Prior to the boom, Ranger had one small lumber yard, the Burton Lingo. At the height in 1919, the city had 14 lumber yards catering to private consumers doing $7 million in business annually. Because of the unprecedented growth, if you were a plumber, electrician, or carpenter, you could find good paying work. The oil field workers had brought their families to this boom, and there was a constant need to improve their standard of living. The chamber enabled this growth, applying across the United States to the Department of Labor for the specific requirements the city needed to fill gaps and helping fill positions as soldiers returned from World War I. 
aiding in the establishment of legitimate businesses, and coordinating workers were only two of the many ways in which the Chamber of Commerce assisted the development of Ranger. It was often difficult to distinguish the early efforts of the Chamber from those of a normal municipal government. The leaders of the Chamber of Commerce were essentially the same men who were going to lead the city council when incorporation came 16 months after oil was discovered. They did not sit idly waiting for word from Austin that it was okay to start making laws. On the April 1919 day of the first city council meeting, ordinances were already written to create a board of health, a school board, policies for eating and drinking establishments, and numerous other necessities. They passed a privy law as well as a garbage disposal law. One of the first things they did was authorize $315,000 from future tax receipts they had already spent during the first 16 unincorporated months acquiring a police department, starting some road construction, and contracting for garbage disposal. They passed a bond for $750,000 to pay for that and to begin new construction on roads. They established a property tax to pay for it all, and in the first year, over $500,000 was collected. The tax rate was not high, set at 1.75%. Another $750,000 bond was passed in December 1919. They showed up with pre-negotiated contracts for construction and utility companies. Many initiatives were well worth the money thrown at them. $73,000 was designated for a sewer project that was scheduled to take 100 days. After multiple extensions and additional funding, it was completed in 278 days and extended over 35 miles. But the city's special sanitation budget for removal of human waste from the streets was reduced from $33,000 to $3,000 in one year. The removal of the blight to the city alone was worth the expense. Roads in Ranger were an ongoing problem and the subject of international humor. With tax levies of nearly $200,000 for the roads and direct levies against the owners of the property for curbs, more than 40 blocks of city streets with the underlying sewers were paved in two years. The initial project the city wanted was completed and Ranger was lifted from the mud in June 1921. They also managed the school situation with skill. Due to high property taxes, the city could pay wages higher than most school districts. Even so, filling the teaching positions was a problem faced by the city. Initially, there was a teacher shortage due to the war. But even after, many came but left immediately for oil positions of greater pay. For a time, the problem was so severe that the school board did not know from one day to the next which teachers would show up. Their solution was to provide housing for the teachers, called a teacherage, as part of their compensation to encourage them to stay. Superintendent McNew stated that the guarantee of housing made a significant difference as did the promise of a 10% salary bonus for completing the school year. The pay, including room and board, and the fact that it was indoor, non-manual labor, made it exceed the wage of the unskilled day laborer by a wide margin and was competitive with many other oil field positions. Starting with five doctors, the number of medical professionals in Ranger increased rapidly with the boom. By December 1919, there were at least 29 doctors in town, 15 conducting general practice. There were two female doctors, one who specialized in podiatry and another who called herself an osteopath. They even had a phrenologist. There were at least three dentists in town also. After the 1920 census confirmed a population over 10,000, the city became entitled to a county hospital. It opened in February 1924. Electricity was not an issue handled at that first meeting, but it was dealt with quickly. A new company, now known as the Texas Electric Service Company, then formed as the Oil Belt Power Company, 
gathered the local companies and propped them up while it built a major plant on the Leon River. When it was completed in November 1920, all the communities in the region were connected, including the oil fields, and all of the small companies shut down. In July 1919, Southwestern Telephone and Telegraph Company came to Ranger and offered to replace the old hand crank system they had in the pre-boom days with a modern common battery switchboard. The first switchboard unit they would install would handle at least 900 telephones. The company promised to be in operation by 1 January 1920, though there were numerous failings and false starts on the part of Ma Bell. Service finally began over two years later in March 1922. Ranger experienced many fortunate events in October 1917, only one of which was the discovery of oil. They also had three different types of community leadership that were able to come together to build a solid foundation, first by removing people from the city and alleviating pressure, then by providing the businesses necessary to make possible the construction and development efforts, and finally, by providing exemplary leadership with the foresight and courage to spend on development and improvements while there was money to spend. They did not hold back, but chose to invest in the central role they believed their city would play in Texas oil. The city ended the boom with roads, buildings, and an underlying core foundation that still serves the community today.